welcome to another episode of What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? I'm Karen E. Osborne. I hope you've known me by now. I hope you've been watching this series from the very beginning, or at least catching up with some of the newer ones. And I'm the author of Getting It Right and Tangled Lies, which just came out uh, this July. And my guest that you're gonna meet in a minute, she has a book that just came out in July as well. And my next book, I'm so excited to say, uh, is coming out June 16th, 2022, but you'll hear more about that later. Let me introduce my amazing guest. I'm going to read uh, her, her little introduction so I don't get anything wrong. So my guest today is author Gail Aldwin. And Gail is a novelist, a poet, and a script writer. Her debut coming of age novel, The The String Games, was a finalist in the People's Book Prize and the Dorchester Literary Festival Writing Prize 2020. Uh, Following a stint as a university lecturer, you have a doctorate, right, Gail? Yes, Yes. I do. Uh, Gail's children's picture book, Pandemonium, and that's a great title for a children's picture book, was published. Her latest book, This Much Huxley Knows, came out July 8th of this year. Welcome, welcome, Gail. Thank you so much for having me. Ah, I'm delighted to have you. So let's start because everybody, you know, most of my audience is from the U.S., you're gonna help us expand, (laughs) but most of our audience is from the US. And so I'm sure they will notice your beautiful accent. So tell us uh, about that accent. You're from uh, Dorset, England, right? But you also spend time in Uganda. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, my home is in Dorset um, and I live there with my husband um, and goldfish in the pond. So we have a lovely house It's in Dorchester, which is famous for the Thomas Hardy connection. This is where Thomas Hardy lived. So you can visit his cottage and it's the whole area is beautiful and very inspiring. Um, And our house overlooks water meadows. So it's a a lovely place to write. Um, But at the moment we're on a sort of uh, journey in that we've decided to let our house as a holiday home and we're traveling around the country. So we spent, Uh, eight weeks in Edinburgh and I'm currently in Cambridge enjoying theatre at the Oxford um, Shakespeare Festival so going to lots of outdoor performances so making the most of being a writer because you can just take your writing with you you don't need to be in a specific base. That is one of the beautiful things and how did you end up in Uganda? Well that was uh, a law I'd been on I've been on a um mailing list for a very long time for a voluntary organization called VSO. Um, But most of their um, voluntary opportunities are for a year or two years. Now, my husband has no interest in doing anything like that at all. So I was thinking this is never gonna happen. And then up popped a vacancy for six months. And I thought, oh, I think we can survive for six months separation. Um, but in the end, it, it, that vacancy came and went. And then I came up, they came up with a four month vacancy in Uganda, where I worked at the Biddy Biddy refugee settlement. Now that's in the northwest of the country, very close to the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. So the refugees were mainly from South Sudan because that's been a country in turmoil for years. And even though South, South Sudan has had independence for about 10 years, is there's still lots of rebels and a lot lots of um, difficulties there. So the refugees really started arriving in Uganda in 2017. But the settlement was a, an absolutely massive place. It was the size of a city. Um, mm-hmm. And I worked in 16 villages in zone three of the settlement. There were five zones. Um, and my job was to work with children and families, young children, sort of three to five. Uh, and their parents to sort of build resilience and well-being. So we did a lot of things like, you know, how you can play games with your children when there are no toys. So we did a lot of clapping games, miming games, rhymes, songs and rhymes, dancing, all those things that you could do without toys because the resources there were obviously very limited. And the parents had few resources because 
their priorities were, you know, keeping their house. I mean, it, Bidi Bindi was a quite an innovative settlement because um, every family who arrived was given a plot of land so that they could build a clay house with a thatch roof and they could grow vegetables in the garden, which ideally in some of the places you could, but the land was formerly hunting ground and was quite infertile. So many of the families were very dependent on UN distributions of food and soap. Um, and so they had lots of different priorities. Sometimes the caring for their children was some way down the line. Yeah. And it was just re-establishing those traditional games that you can play with children that are yeah. fun for parents and the children. And, and, and they all were of absolutely, us, all yes. of us could play yeah. with our grandchildren and not always have mm. to have the toys. Yeah. Did, did that experience show up in any of your writing? Well, I think it's very difficult to write about situations like that. I didn't ever want to be accused of cultural appropriation. And I think it's kind of very, a very sensitive issue. Um, but in the novel I'm working on at the moment, I have got a Ugandan in the novel because of the, um, when Idi Amin was in power in the seventies and he expelled all the Asians um, and many of them came to Britain. So I have a a Ugandan Asian in my new novel. So it is nice to bring in things that you know about, things that you've experienced in your yeah. novels. Um, yes. And that was a good opportunity. And yes, add something, a new, a new flavor uh, to, the, to the conversation. So um, as you, what type of reader, when you were a child yourself, so you were just working with these parents and children in, in Uganda, not just, but you did, and just talking about it. Um, think back to your own childhood. You know, what kind of reader were you back then and how, if at all, did it inform and uh, help you as an adult writer? Well, I was a non-reading child. So hmm. I didn't read effectively until I was, well, I could decode a text from about 11 years. So I could read a book. I was probably a functional reader by about 11. But I never saw books as a source of interest and pleasure. And my poor mother, who's a school teacher, I was always given books. Um, and when I used to see a book-shaped present, my heart used to sink because I thought, I'm never going to read this. I'm never going to enjoy it. Um, but, my, I, but I did enjoy stories. So my mum even when I was quite old, even when I was 13, she would still read to me. So I was still getting stories. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, it was her sort of commitment to sharing stories that actually got me on the reading path. When I was about 17, I was living in London. I, had a, I was working in London. And I had a long train journey that was a commute. And it was then that I read my first book out of choice. And it was my older sister's book, and it was uh, the the um, the Valley of the Dolls, and that was the oh, first yes. book I read. <laughs> I was really interested. I went back and read that again quite recently, and I was surprised. I thought it was quite contemporary, but it starts off in the nineteen forties, I think. So I, it didn't come flooding back. It wasn't the book that I remembered it to be. So it's interesting how your memory picks out certain features, isn't it? And they stay with you and others just disappear. It's true. So in terms of how that. it's affected me as a is how it's affected me as a writer. I mean, it does mean that I've got um, big gaps in my writing history, um, particularly with children's literature, but I've tried to make up, up for it since. Um, I am what they call a shallow reader. They took, I've come across these terms, deep reader and shallow reader. And a deep reader will find a novelist and read every single book they've published. And a shallow reader will read one book of many different authors. And I certainly a shallow reader. Um, I like to read lots of different authors. Um, and now I'm a sort of published author myself. I read lots of new novelists, you know, you know, debut novels. I think it's really interesting to see what kind of book makes it through. Um, and, I, and I think you're supporting other, other new novelists as well if you're buying the books. You actually, you're a wonderful supporter of novelists. You're always promoting them and helping other people meet them, which is a wonderful thing. But I think both of us would hope 
that we have many, many deep readers among our reading public <laughs> who, who love your books and look for your next one and who love my books and look for my next one. Mm. But I do understand the, I too am a, a shallow reader. I read lots of, I like to read lots of different genres and like lots of different uh, authors. And like you, I went back to read some of my favorite books as a teenager and uh, not the classics, but the popular books that I liked as a teenager. And I thought, oh, what did I see in this? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, you know, it, it, it didn't yeah. read, it didn't meet the test of time. Um, so uh, we like to recommend books uh, to our audience. Is there something that you have read recently or you know, that you could recommend? Yes. I was I was going to show you the cover of mm -hmm. this book called Resilience. Um, it's mm -hmm. actually a short story collection. So it's Resilience by Jim Bates. It's interesting because I met Jim on Facebook. Um, he was sort of being mentored by a friend of mine. And then, you know, we just became friends on Facebook. And I followed his writing for a number of years. He has had lots of stories, short stories published on a website. So now he's got a whole collection out. Mm. So it was really a joy to read this book um, because I'd read some of the stories online and again to go back and visit them again. He's a great writer about relationships, um, relationships being between couples, between parents and children, between siblings. And I think um, short stories can be overlooked, but I think they fit so well into these this frenetic life that we live at the moment you can pick up a short story collection and just read one story and it gives you that kind of same sense of satisfaction as if you had written a whole, you know, read a whole novel. So I'm a, you know, I'm really, really, I can thoroughly recommend this um, and I've really enjoyed it, so. That's excellent. Yeah, I like keeping a short story collection on my nightstand in case I'm having trouble sleeping or, you know, and it's just long enough to then let me, read and drift back uh, back to sleep instead of going to the third chapter of the novel that I'm reading. So I love short stories mm. as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a great recommendation. Thank you. Um, I wanted to read this question to you. So one reviewer wrote about your, we wanna talk about the book that just came out, right? Yeah. Wanna, yeah. So one reviewer wrote, read this and feel young again. And this was about this much Huxley knows. And also I've been following you on Twitter and you have these wonderful posts about how, what it takes to speak in the voice of a child. You know, how one can, can write in the voice of a child. So tell us about this book and how it came about and, and this art of right. channeling a child. <laughs> Yes, well, this, this is a copy of the book here. I'll just hold it up. So we've got this much Huxley knows. And I love the cover, cover image because you've got this exuberant young boy, you know, jumping for joy. And that is exactly Huxley. So in some ways, this was an easy book to write because his voice is so different from my own voice. I wasn't just tempted to slip into my own kind of vernacular. We were at absolutely other ends of the scale, young boy, mature woman. Um, so it, it does seem quite unusual to get into that voice. But what I did was I you know, obviously draw on my own experiences. So I have got a 25 year old son who was young once. And although Huxley is not my son, some of the things he got up to ended up in this book. Um, and uh, I taught in schools. I taught young children for a long time. So I drew on anecdotes from schools and they ended up in the book. But I think the key thing for me was to get inside the head of a young child was to reconnect with my own inner child, if you like. Mm. So one of the things I did now, it sounds completely bonkers, but I remembered when I was a young girl, how I used to um, sit in the airing cupboard in my parents' house. Because you know, you've got that warm enclosed space, which is safe. Uh, and dark and just where you're just on your own and you're just can think about things and all sorts of funny these thoughts you know run around your head 
in that situation. So I thought, how, how can I get in touch with that child again? So I sort of cleared out my cupboard under the stairs and just sort of <laughs> sat in there for a while. And it's amazing, really, because you, you're just taken so back to those experiences. And I think that's what I drew upon when I was writing Huxley. Now, Huxley is a lonely boy and he wants to become friends um, with other children, um, but they kind of like football and he doesn't. And there's all sorts of barriers to him making friends. So what he does is he thinks he's going to make friends by changing words to make them funny. Um, but actually, it just kind of annoys a lot of his, uh, the adults around him. But he says things like, well, when they're learning to read in school and they have to break words down into syllables, he calls them silly balls. <laughs> um, when um, he's doing his exercise, he doesn't call it I'm exercising. He says, I'm doing exit size. And of course, I have set the novel um, at the time, just after the Brexit referendum. And instead of calling it Brexit, he calls it breaks it. You know, that is quite, <laughs> it couldn't be truer really. You know, we're all kind of sad. Well, certainly I'm very sad at, at leaving Europe. And so um, when I'd finished the sort of first draft, I had the novel stuffed with all these sort of corrupted words. And I had to weed some of them out, otherwise it would be too much. But I had such fun writing this novel. It was an absolute joy to write. Um, and it, it enabled me to sort of revisit places from my past. So the, the locations that feature in the novel are places like the park, um, the, the department store that has a cafe, um, the swimming pool, and all those places I just I kind of just in so enjoyed going back to these sorts of places that I experienced with my children uh, when they were young and that I enjoyed myself and um, so it was a, a thoroughly enjoyable book to write. It sounds like it's a thoroughly enjoyable book to read as well and you mentioned early in the in our little conversation uh, that you're working on something right now can you tell our audience about what's what is your work in progress? Yeah, I think there's always going to be a child, a young person in, in my book. So this one is quite a different book because it's a dual timeline book. Um, so one timeline is set in 2010 and it's a redundant menopausal journalist. Um, and she decides to investigate the disappearance of a 16 year old girl from a West Country village. Mm. So the other voice is a first person narrative from the viewpoint of the girl who goes missing. Mm. And so it's how the two stories collide really. Um, so the 16 year old girl actually becomes infatuated with her mass teacher. So it's a story of infatuation and exploitation set in the seventies. And we all know what that period was like. Um, and then the journalist is kind of reestablishing her life through developing a podcast that will get her back into the world of work that sounds fascinating and are you well into it uh i'm it's my i'm working on the second draft at the moment so what i did was i wrote one storyline out from beginning to end and then i wrote the other storyline out from beginning to end, and i sort of tried to get them to dovetail together so the reading that i'm doing at the moment is just trying to check that chapters are in the right places and the reveals are in the right place mm. um, so it's a process but I'm enjoying really enjoying the two voices and actually how well they go together they sort of juxtapose really well I've also enjoyed <clears throat> because it fits with my timeline as well because I was in, in my teenage years in the 70s and you know uh, the same as 2010 in my 50s so it is my timeline so I don't have to do a lot of research that's why I like writing contemporary novels in a way because you can remember most of it um, but I so enjoyed going back to the 70s and just remembering the vernacular that we used to use in the 70s that sort of language that is slightly not so used so well because I was saying to my husband oh I've got to get a shut your face in this book somewhere um, which is you know a slang you know shut your face rather like shut up I suppose mm -hmm. but you don't hear it so much these days and I've quite yeah. enjoyed yeah. just 
you, you know, remembering that kind of language um, that was used so much in the 70s. It's, it just sounds wonderful. The project sounds wonderful. And um, you can get this much Huxley knows it's available uh, now in every place that you buy and borrow books. And how if our audience would like to follow you, um, find out more about you, find out more about their books, where could they go and look online? Well, well I'm very active on Twitter. So I really like tweeting. So I, my uh, handle is at Gail Aldwin. So do come along and visit me there because I love interacting with people. And I've got um, a blog, which is gaylordwin.com. Excellent. And I have to say, Karen, I have your book here, which I've just started oh, reading. And you. what an opening. Very atmospheric and sinister and uh, draws you in. So, <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I, hope, I, hope you, I hope you enjoy it. Um, yes, yeah. Tangled Lies is a, is a murder mystery, but it's very uh, character driven. You know, it's it's mm. it's less plot driven than uh, most murderous mysteries. You know, it's really about the people. So I hope you will. Mm. I hope you will enjoy it, and I hope all of you will enjoy it. And I hope you will come back. I hope you'll visit Gail on Twitter, and I hope that you will buy her book and write an amazing five star review for her on uh, Goodreads and Amazon and Barnes and Noble. We so appreciate that. And we hope that you'll return for the next episode of What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? Thanks for watching.